All right, let's get started. So I'm going to talk about, about uh, some, you know, the top five questions you should be asking as you're evaluating uh, big data technologies. The first one is, how do I model my application? This is, this is going to directly affect your developers and even your ops team as, as your application ages and uh, adds new features. So some of the popular options are a key value store, kind of the most basic, uh, tabular data, uh, graph databases, maybe sort of, kind of. I don't know of any graph databases that are kind of native big data platforms, but there are uh, graph databases like Titan, which is built on Cassandra, that you could legitimately say is providing a graph interface to big data. Uh, and the last one is a document uh, data model. So I, I come to Cassandra after uh, evaluating it as an outsider. So I wasn't part of the original team that created Cassandra, uh, but I evaluated uh, scalable databases for Rackspace's needs and settled on Cassandra. And one of the things that I you know, noticed as part of my evaluation is that uh, schema is a good thing. So document databases and some other databases um, eschew schema and avoid it and say, you know, you can put anything in a document that you want. Uh, you know, he, this could be one user record. The next user record uh, might have an integer for his user ID instead of a UUID field. Uh, you know, you can have different uh, fields across different record types. And this, this is, the flexibility can be useful as you're prototyping and evolving your application. But what you see as applications uh, get successful and uh, as, as they get longer on in their life cycle is you start having multiple uh, code bases that start to touch that data. You know, the data is like the single, it's like the common room of, of the uh, dormitory where you know, everyone meets together at the database. And, uh, so what you see is that you, you might start off with a Ruby on Rails app that's you know, creating records like this, but then someone wants to write a cron job in Python. So he needs to know what kind of data is in your documents. You know, there's no way for him to tell other than you know, maybe grabbing a sampling of those documents and trying to see what kind of common patterns there are, or he has to go you know, dive through your Ruby source code. So a schema, having a, a formal schema that says this is what kind of data is in these tables and these parts of the data uh, is a good thing. It can, it can help uh, your uh, development as your application gets to that stage of having multiple uh, languages and multiple code bases interacting with it. So uh, with Cassandra, we take the approach of we have a mostly tabular uh, data model, and I'll get to the mostly part in just a second, but uh, this, is, this is legal uh, Cassandra data definition. So uh, we have a language called the CQL, the Cassandra query language, that gives you a subset of, of SQL uh, that is appropriate for, for doing uh, data modeling and data access with Cassandra. So one of the things that, that is good about uh, document databases that we've, we've uh, wanted to uh, adopt in Cassandra is that they do make it easy to make collections of uh, you know, different data types. So that maps very naturally to programming languages where you know, I, I will model my user record as having a list or a set of email addresses. So in the relational world, if I wanted to say this user table has uh, I, the, or the user records in this table have multiple email addresses, I would do it like this, where I have a uh, many-to-one relationship between the email addresses and the users, uh, and then I would query that by doing joins. Well, you know, Cassandra does not support joins because you know, that it, it's a great way to kill your performance in a distributed system. So we don't support that. Uh, but what we do support is creating collections of uh, of data in a field. So in, in red here, uh, the email addresses is declared to be a set of text. So this, this is how you would do that in Cassandra, where you would say, uh, add this, I would take the union of this new set that I'm giving you and add that to the existing set of email addresses. 
So in a sense, we've, we've, we've taken the, the best of the uh, tabular uh, you know, formal schema worlds and the best of the document worlds, and, and we give you both of those. So I, I said that we don't do joints. You know, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, we also don't do uh, group by, we don't do subqueries, and there's an interesting part about, there's an interesting limitation on order by. So what we want to do, our goal here is uh, we want to be able to give you your data in the way that, in the order that it's appropriate for your application, but we don't have to, we don't want to have to sort millions of rows at runtime to give you that. That's going to kill your performance. So what we, what we have you do is we have you declare your ordering or your clustering of your data ahead of time, and then we preserve that for you as you update data in Cassandra. So uh, to, to what I'm going to show you is, is how we would do a query like this in Cassandra. What I'm, what I'm envisioning here is modeling um, you know, a, a tweet data where I have users who follow other users and users create tweets. So what I'm going to do is to find the tweets that my friends have made. So I've got, I've got uh, the user whose friends we're trying to find in red here. So in the second user ID, that's the friend we're trying to find, uh, that's the user whose friends we're trying to find. And then the blue user ID, that's going to be the users who, the friends who made the tweets. So we're doing a subquery here. So what the query plan would look like would be something like this at the bottom where we're, we're grabbing out those red users, which are the friends, and then for each of those users, we need to go and find the tweets that they've made. So you, you can see how you know, this, this quickly becomes uh, bad for performance because look at all the random IOs I'm having to do. I didn't even, ha I didn't even draw all of, all of the blue lines for all of the red ones. I just drew them for one of them. So you know, we, we do lots of random IO for this kind of query. So what we do in Cassandra is when I, I would, instead of doing that subquery, which could also be expressed as a join, instead of doing that, I'm going to denormalize the tweets that each user's friends have made into a table called timeline. And here's how I would declare that. I would say that I'm going to have uh, the user ID there, which is going to be the user whose friends I want to query. And then for each, uh, each row, I'm also going to denormalize the tweets that those friends have made. So I'm going to have the tweet ID, the tweet author, which is going to be another user ID, and then the tweet body. And then what I do is I declare that there's a primary key, a compound primary key on the user ID and the tweet ID. And so what that tells Cassandra is that first part of the primary key is going to be my partition key. So what I have over here is that I have, for each uh, user, I have basically a partition in orange of the tweets that his friends have made. And then Cassandra will sort uh, those partitions on the rest of the primary key, that tweet ID. So each of these are going to be in sorted order by the tweet ID column. So what that means is I can say select from timeline and then where my user ID is this partition and then I get the most recent tweets his friends have made without having to do any extra computation at runtime. I just do a sequential read, I get it back in the order that I want. So this is, this is the key concept when data modeling with Cassandra that uh, you, you give up joins in exchange for uh, you know, denormalizing into sorted partitions. Second question uh, to ask about you know, data stores that you're evaluating is how does it perform? Uh, so there's a, there's a, this touches on a lot of things. Uh, one, one thing that I wanted to highlight is, does it handle data sets larger than memory? So this, this is a graph uh, from Urban Airship's uh, uh, data store monitoring system from a talk they gave uh, a few months ago. I've blacked out at the top what, what database service this is because that's not what I, what I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to point out that, you know, when the, you know, this, this storage engine, when the data set exceeded RAM, 
the performance went through the floor. This is not the, hot, of course, you know, if your hot data set exceeds RAM, it's, you're going to be doing more random I.O., your performance is going to be worse. That's normal. Now, that's not what this is talking about. This is saying when the total data set size exceeded RAM, my performance went through the floor. So that's, that's something to, to be aware of. You know, does this uh, uh, product really support data sets larger than memory? Now, of course, there's some that are explicitly saying that's not our goal, you know, like Redis. They're saying, we're an in-memory storage system. We don't care about data sets larger than memory, and you know, take it or leave it. You know, that, that's, that's fine. Sometimes that has its place. But you want to be cautious of, of systems that you know, ostensibly support data sets larger than memory, but then you, know, you get this when you actually push it past that limit. Another thing that's important to know is how does your uh, database deal with locking and deal with you know, multiple threads, multiple requests coming in simultaneously. Uh, you know, the, the classic, you know, in the relational database world, the kind of the gold standard is, is row level locking. Uh, you also have MVCC with Oracle and PostgreSQL that does you know, the same thing in kind of a different way. Um, in the NoSQL world, you have to be a little more careful because a lot of uh, products do kind of the equivalent of table level locking. Uh, so that, that, can, that can really cause a lot of contention when you're throwing a mixed workload at your system. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how Cassandra's storage engine, uh, we, don't, we actually don't even lock on writes. Uh, we have a different way of, of reconciling conflicts on writes. We don't need to lock on writes and we use uh, lock-free concurrency algorithms to prevent, uh, to give you isolation between the reads and the writes. Another thing that, that you want to know about is you know, what's the efficiency story of my database? So the, where I'm going with this is, uh, in particular, a lot of document databases, in fact, all of the ones that I know about, uh, when you update one field in a document, it actually has to pull the ent entire document back into memory, update that field, and then rewrite the whole thing back out. So it's, it's highly inefficient. So uh, again, I'll, I'll show you how this works in the context of Cassandra. And with Cassandra, even with our collections that I showed you with like the email addresses set, when I uh, add new elements to that set, I'm only writing out those new elements. I'm not having to rewrite any other parts of your data. And the last thing that's important to talk about in terms of performance and how that affects your storage engine is durability. Uh, what, what's the story when I send you uh, new data and you say, okay, that's, that's been written, you know, and then there's a power failure, is that data still there when you come back up? So that's another important thing to keep in mind. So how, how Cassandra addresses these aspects is we use a log-structured storage engine. So what, what I'm gonna be showing you is here, in the upper left, we have data coming in, where I've, I've got the primary key in uh, light green, and then the uh, data in that row in a darker color. And what we're gonna do is we're going to first, Cassandra first appends that update to a commit log. And then we're gonna put it in this in-memory structure here called a mem table. So it's important to note that you know, this is what happens for any part of a row that gets updated. If I update a single column, you know, there will be this, this tuple of uh, primary key and the single column that's being updated that comes in. Or it could be an entire row at once. It's flexible that way. So we're going, to, we're going to add those to the commit log and the mem table. We're going to start putting more data into that. We're going to, it keep, keeps getting appended to the mem table. Here we've added more, we've updated another column in the same row. So there's a separate entry in the commit log. Commit logs just, just append only. Uh, in the mem table though, we've combined those. So we combine those because they're part of the same row. So we say, okay, we'll, we'll just combine those into a larger entry there. We'll add some uh, data from other rows and uh, some more data to the first row. And then when the mem table gets full, we flush it to disk. And so we're, we're never going to do a random I.O. against data that's already been written. We're never gonna do update in place. And as a corollary, we never have to go read what the old value for, uh, what the old value was for a column that you updated. We just put the new value 
into memory. Eventually, it'll get turned into a data file. And then what we do is when we do reads, we'll, we'll examine the existing data files and we'll keep the most recent version of every column that you're requesting. And then what we do in the background is we go through and do something called compaction, where we merge the data files and throw out uh, obsolete data. So you know, throughout all this, we're only doing sequential I.O. on writes. So, that, so that's why we don't need to do uh, locking on writes, because it, you know, it's just the same case as I had an old version from several minutes ago versus I have a, an old version from a microsecond ago. The same code path that handles those. Uh, so because we're not doing any random writes, it turns out that Cassandra is you know, extremely well suited for modern solid state disks because you don't have to worry about write amplification that happens when you're doing small random IOPS against SSDs. Uh, there's a, an entire presentation about this that uh, Rick Branson gave that you can, you can Google Cassandra solid state drives, it'll come up. Uh, that's as much detail as I want to go into that today. One thing I did want to bring out here is that uh, because we're focused on doing sequential I.O. on writes, uh, you know, good write performance kind of came naturally to us. Uh, good read performance took a little work. So early on, uh, kind of in the, in the dark ages of Cassandra, the 06 version a couple years ago, you know, it did have a well-deserved reputation as being slower on reads than on writes. Uh, so you know, we were doing about 40% uh, uh, to 30% as many reads as writes in Cassandra 06. Cassandra 1.0, which we released last year, you know, we, really, we knew that we had to narrow that gap. You know, for balanced workloads, people need you know, fantastic write performance and read performance. So we put a lot of effort into narrowing that gap. And so even though we increased write performance another 30% over 0.6, uh, we increased read performance 300% and really caught that up. The third question to ask about big data solutions, how does it handle failure? You know, when, you're, when, you're ha when you have a 3% chance of a hard drive failing per year, you can kind of get by with you know, RAID and, and backup servers and, and you cross your fingers that uh, you, know, another, you don't lose another disk while you're healing the first one. But uh, when, you're, when you're talking about uh, multiple terabytes and petabytes spread across clusters of dozens and hundreds of machines, you need a more systematic, uh, thought-out solution to that. So kind of the, the classic approach to, to scaling out is to say, well, I'm going to partition my data across different uh, you know, replica sets. Each of those replica sets will have uh, a master in, in light blue here. And we'll have some kind of router that tells the clients what partition each row that he wants is in. And then the master will replicate updates that come in to the slave nodes in a darker blue. And then if the master dies, then we'll have some kind of failover uh, to promote a slave. Well, there's, there's a couple problems with this. Uh, one is that you know, fundamentally, you know, if I'm doing a failover process that you know, often involves replaying some kind of uh, write-ahead log, then you know, there's, there's a, a gap there during which that, the data in that partition is unavailable. You, know, you, can't, you can't get to it because they're busy deciding who the new master is going to be. Uh, the other problem there is that failover is an inherently, uh, it, it, makes, it, it should make you nervous because it's not something that, that is happening all the time. It only happens when something has already gone wrong. So it, it tends to be less well tested. You have corner cases like what happens if the, the master uh, had a, was part of a network partition. So it was still alive, but it, you know, it couldn't talk to the rest of the cluster. So you failed over, you brought up a new master. Now the network, you know, the router gets fixed. The original master can talk to the cluster. Now you have two nodes that think they're masters. So there, there's, there's you know, com complex corner cases that can go on there that can bite you. Um, even Google, who's been doing this kind of system longer than just about anyone else, has had two different day-long outages of Google App Engine uh, where different corner cases of master failover uh, bit them. So a better approach is to design a fully distributed system, and this is what Cassandra does, where you have you know, all of the nodes in your cluster are uh, equal, there are no masters. Here I have, um, I'm, I'm writing data to partition number one here, 
Uh, but the client doesn't have to talk to any of the nodes that actually store partition number one. It can talk to any node in the cluster. It will know how to write, route the data to that uh, partition. Uh, and you know, if that node that the client's talking to fails, it can connect to any other node in the cluster without having to wait for any kind of failover. So a very robust, uh, very robust system. This extends to multiple data centers as well. You know, once you have a fully distributed system, it's much easier to uh, take it into a, a, you know, a multiple data center world where clients in, in this data center down here can do local writes that get propagated asynchronously to the rest of the cluster. Uh, and so you, if, if you have a master-slave design, everyone has to talk to the master. So if, if you're 200 milliseconds away in another data center, you know, your update you know, is gonna take an extra you know, 400 milliseconds round trip to complete. So you know, th this is a much more powerful design. And what I've tried to call out here, by the way, is you know, up, up at the top in the clouds, you know, those are representing things like Amazon EC2, Rackspace Cloud. Down at the bottom, we have on-premise data centers. Cassandra's totally comfortable spanning that gap like that. And this is an actual uh, design that, that Cassandra users have deployed in production. By the way, uh, when you're doing writes across multiple data centers, Cassandra is efficient about your, your WAN link. You know, you're you're going to have less bandwidth on that link. So what Cassandra will do is, if I want to have three replicas of this, uh, this row that I'm updating in this data center, Cassandra will send one, rep, one, one piece of that row, one copy of that row, to one of those replicas, and then tell that replica to forward it to the others. So we want to be efficient with, with your cross data center link. And it's very, very easy to configure Cassandra to do this. All you need to do is tell Cassandra which nodes are in which data centers. Uh, you can also tell it which nodes are in which racks. And, and it will take it a step further because what you want to avoid is, you want to avoid uh, having, a rack, having a rack failure take out multiple copies of your data. Because uh, you know, coolant, cooler failures, uh, network failures, power failures, you know, all of those can affect an entire rack at once. So, we, so Cassandra's smart about placing your replicas uh, across multiple racks and avoiding those uh, correlated failures. Uh, fourth question, how does it scale? So closely related to uh, how does it handle failures? Because if you have a design that uh, handles fa failures well, uh, it will probably scale well as well. You know, scaling well is, is kind of more of avoiding anti-patterns than it is you know, doing uh, anything particularly right. Uh, you know, if you put more machines in your cluster, they ought to be able to do more work unless you screw it up somehow. That's kind of how I see the, the scaling problem. So you know, ways you can screw it up is if, if you have a central metadata server where you, know, you have to go talk to that metadata server to know where uh, all the replicas are for a, for a row, for instance. Um, or in, in my original diagram about uh, sharding across multiple partitions uh, kind of manually, you know, the routers can be bottlenecks. So what you want to do is you want to just be able to uh, add machines to your cluster, not have to have uh, any special roles that need special care and handling. Uh, you know, the more peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, the more uniform your cluster is, you know, the better that's going to work. And so that, that you know, that works totally well in Cassandra. Netflix did some testing on this uh, late last year where they took it from about 50 nodes to 288 and got a nice flat line of scaling, which is exactly what we want to see. The last thing uh, to ask is, you know, how flexible is, is your database? Uh, and what I mean by this is, you know, you can have hyper-specialized databases and you, you do see some of that in the NoSQL world where you, know, you might have a database that is extremely well-tuned for time series data and doesn't really do anything else. Uh, so what we've tried to do with Cassandra and, and largely succeeded is make it into a general purpose tool that can solve multiple problems. And we, we can even uh, take it out of kind of the NoSQL real-time small query kind of world and start doing more analytical kind of work with it, which is what we've done at Datastax with Datastax Enterprise is we've integrated Hadoop with Cassandra so that, so that you can get the best of both worlds. Um, to illustrate that, I want to go really quickly. We have a demo of a portfolio manager. So these, these different pie charts here are how much of a given stock I have in my portfolio. 
And so what we want to do is we want to compute for each portfolio, we want to show the user his you know, largest historical 10-day loss with that mix of stocks. So we have on the real-time side, we're, we're handling live stocks, which is you know, what's the current price of uh, each stock in the market. And then I have a bunch of portfolios that you know, for each uh, user and stock that he owns, I record how many shares he has. And then I have a historical table that says, for each stock, I'm going to have uh, you know, what its closing price was on every day. So what I want to compute is, I want to compute the historical loss for every portfolio where you know, this is when your worst, uh, your worst 10 day loss was and how much you would have lost with that mix of stocks. So I'm, I'm going to help you manage your, your risk that way. So what we're going to do is uh, we can use a, a Hadoop tool called Hive against this data in DataStax Enterprise. And so what we're, what we're, it's going to be a couple intermediate steps. First, we're going to compute uh, the 10 day return for every given stock ending on a given date. And you can see that we're, we're using full SQL. We're doing joins here. Uh, you know, that's totally fine. The next step, we're going to compute the 10 day return for each portfolio. And here we're doing aggregation, we're doing group by, totally supported again. Finally, we're going to, to bring that together and pick the worst of those portfolio return rows. Uh, we're going to do a subquery, another group by, another join to compute that. So, so we've gone beyond you know, the, the strictly real time side that Cassandra gives you out of the box, and we've, we've married that with you know, being able to do analytics against your data without having to, to dump it into a separate system, without having to manage HDFS or anything like that. So what we do in DataStax Enterprise is we give you, you know, the Cassandra real-time side, we give you the Hive and Hadoop uh, analytical side. We also give you in the upper left uh, enterprise search through, through Solar, and then we give you management tools that, that you know, help you make sense of all this, know when to add more capacity, and so forth. Uh, this, is, you know, this is all, we've, we've written all of this on top of Cassandra so you don't have to manage multiple systems. You know, if you, once you know how to manage Cassandra, your ops team is good to go for the entire thing. So uh, you know, the, you know, not all Cassandra users use Datastax Enterprise, but there's a healthy amount of overlap. You know, we, we can't talk about all the Datastax Enterprise customers, but I can show you Cassandra users. You know, there's a lot of people uh, you know, running their business on this. Uh, today. And uh, one of those will be talking at, at 2 o'clock about uh, big data in healthcare and how they're using Datastax Enterprise there. So I have time for one or two questions. The question is, what do you do when you want more incremental updates to things like your, your historical 10-day loss in this uh, portfolio example? So uh, Cassandra and Datastax Enterprise give you the tools to do that. Uh, for instance, uh, Twitter built uh, a real-time analytics service called Rainbird that they monitor uh, you know, ad click-through and so forth. Uh, on top of Cassandra. So you, so you have the tools there. Uh, there isn't anything that out of the box where you get something like Esper, where you, where you create a streaming SQL query that, that gives you the updates as they happen. Um, so we, we give you the tools, but we don't really productize it yet. So the question is, if I have uh, short-lived data, uh, he gave the example of 60 days worth of data, how does that affect compaction performance? Um, so we have on the drawing board, so, so first of all, let me back up. Uh, you're, you probably have used Cassandra uh, or know a little bit about it because Cassandra actually has uh, a concept of expiring data built in where you tell it, I want this data to last for 60 days or six months or whatever. And after that, Cassandra will automatically throw it away. So you don't have to uh, explicitly delete it, which is one source of extra compaction work of, of merging those deletes uh, with, the, with the original writes. Uh, so Cassandra will throw that away automatically without you having to explicitly go through, see what's old enough, and delete it. 
Um, and a further step that, that's on the drawing board for a future release would be to actually take it a step further and say, you know, I, I can just throw away entire data files worth of data all at once. I don't even need to scan through them and see who's old enough because I know all of the data in this file is obsolete. I'll just throw that entire file away, which would be even more uh, efficient. All right. So the question is, what's the, what's the efficiency loss from connecting to a node that doesn't store the data that has to route the request to another node in the ring? Um, roughly 10 to 15 percent. Uh, you know, people have done experiments with smart clients, and in fact we support one called the storage proxy client that, that will, it's Java only, but it will route <laughs> directly to the data that has uh, or to the replica that has your data, and it's about 10 to 15 percent more performance. In general, I would say that that's premature optimization, that you know, it adds enough complexity because now you have to tell your client which, you know, you know, about your, uh, your cluster topology and so forth, uh, that we recommend just you know, having dumb clients that just know to connect to any, any node, let Cassandra route it. Um, if you get to where you, know, you have hundreds of nodes and, and that's starting to be real money, that uh, that 10% is costing you, then uh, you do have that path to optimize it. So, if you, you, we basically need to have a fully connected graph anyway, because you know even if I'm talking to one of the replicas, there's gonna be other replicas that I need to talk to. So there isn't really any penalty in terms of extra open sockets. Last question. In one sentence, use, ca use Cassandra. There it is. Yeah, I'd, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, what I've tried to do here is, is give you, you know, these are the questions that you can ask to evaluate those and decide when something may be more appropriate to your use case. Yeah. Well, so what we, what we target with Cassandra is data sets that don't fit on a single machine, you know, whether that's because of data volume or you know, requests per second that we're talking about. So a lot, you know, a lot of the other players aren't even interested in that. They're saying we're best at single machine. Uh, we're giving you developer productivity. We're giving you acid semantics. Uh, but we do that by being on you know, a single machine maybe that replicates to some others. Uh, so we're, we're playing in that other space. Thanks for your time.